for that. Okay, turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. We get to continue our study of this gem of the Bible, this place in Scripture that so clearly, beginning to end, articulates the gospel. How sinful people are declared righteous by God's grace, not on the basis of their own merit or anything they could do, not on the basis of heredity or who they are, not on the basis of intellectual ability or acuity or lineage or beauty or any other thing in us. Sinners are saved solely by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ for the glory of God. Now, this is the only hope for mankind. And the book of Romans, perhaps better than any other place in Scripture, articulates this gospel from beginning to end. It is the theme of this letter. And we're in a section of, chapter, uh, of Romans, chapters 9 to 11, which is a pivotal anchor for the gospel itself. For in Romans 9 to 11, we have at stake the very promises of God. Now, you and I live in a world of broken promises. You have no doubt broken promises promises, and you've no doubt been hurt by those who have broken promises. Whether it's the time I purchased a countertop mixer for my wife on eBay, and it never arrived, and my hundreds of dollars <laughs> went into the internet somewhere. <laughs> Whether it's some broken promise from a government entity or a figure of authority Perhaps you stood at an altar when somebody said, I will love you forever till death do us part. We've broken promises and we've been the victims of broken promises. We just live in a world of people who cannot keep their word. What if God could break his promises? What kind of a world would this be? If God would not keep his word. And I think there's a, an issue at stake that's being answered by Romans 9 to 11 that gets at the heart of that very question. Does God keep his word? Can God break his promises? But there's an angle to that question that Paul wants us to explore that's really critical that I think we might feel more acutely as believers in Jesus Christ. Can I break God's promises? Do you understand the question? Is there something that I could do that could perhaps abrogate God's gracious commitments to me? The things that God has promised in his word, could, could I undo them by my behavior? Could I out -sin God's grace to me in the gospel? Could I make God change his mind about me? Listen, these are critical questions. And perhaps they're questions that you yourselves have asked. And it's a question that was asked in Paul's day specifically because the nation of Israel had been given glorious, magnificent, unilateral, undeserved promises. And yet they were seen in Paul's day as having rejected their own Messiah and having in large part turned away from the gospel of life. The good news that was promised to humanity through them and to which they were promised recipients. And they turned their backs on Messiah. And so the question is, has Israel been rejected? And again, I want us to think about what's at stake in God's rejection of Israel if he has done such a thing. Now think about Romans 8, the chapter that led up to Paul's excursus on Israel in Romans 9 to 11. Think about some of the promises there that God makes to every single believer in Jesus Christ, Jew, Gentile, any era, any place. Think about what God promises there. Romans 8, 1, no condemnation. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 11, spiritual life in our mortal bodies. Though we are dying, we are decaying, we are falling apart physically. And we experience all the effects of the curse in our physicality. Yet there is spiritual life inside you, Christian, that God has promised to come to full fruition. Romans 8, 15, we are to be heirs of the inheritance that belongs to God. We are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You know what it is to inherit something. 
you get what belongs to your father. And God says, everything I have is yours, Christian. Romans 8, 17, we have the promise of glory incomparable, right? Pile up all the trials, all the difficulties, all the, all the hard things in this life, and go ahead and try to compare them with the weight of glory that is to be revealed in you. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, Romans 8, 18, same thing. You cannot compare them. In fact, it's so incomparable, those two realities, a glorious weight promised to Christians and hard trials here, they should not be put on a balance as if they could be measured against each other. You can't measure infinity over and against dust. Now, you've been promised incomparable glory, Christian. Romans eight twenty one. we are promised freedom from slavery to corruption. That is, every bit of the curse of God and the effects of sin on the created world, that which makes the creation itself groan, craning its neck around the corner, looking to see when Christians get to be glorified, because when Christians are glorified, the slavery to corruption ends. It's a promise, a promise for Christians, a promise for all believers in Messiah that has effects to all of creation. Romans 8.23, the promise of a full, finalized adoption that is the redemption of the body. You and I already have been adopted if we're in Christ. We cry out, Abba, Father, by the Holy Spirit. And yet, there is a fullness of that adoption that is still yet to come when you are united in your spiritual, invisible you with a glorified physicality. The, The promised resurrection still yet to come. That's a promise from God. Romans 8, 26 and 27, we are promised help in prayer. The Holy Spirit himself intercedes on our behalf so that God's will is known and brought about in our lives for our good. Romans 8, 28, we are promised all things for good. All things for good. Romans 8, 29, we are promised to be conformed to the image of Christ. This is what you've been predestined for. Before time began, God set his affections on you, Christian, and promised this thing. You will resemble Jesus Christ. You will look like Christ as far as it is possible for a finite being to resemble the infinite Son of God. It's a promise. Romans 8.31, God is for you, Christian. And the corollary to that, who could possibly be against you? Romans 8.32, God promises to freely give us all things. Listen, he's already given us the most infinitely costly thing. It's now an easy thing for God to give us all things. Romans 8.36 and 37, we are promised to be conquerors, not avoiding tribulations, but conquerors through tribulations. Romans 8.38 and 39, the promise of no separation. Let's read Romans 8, 28 to the end of the chapter and just remember a portion of the things God has promised for us in Christ. We're only going to read a part of Romans 8, (laughs) and Romans 8 is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of God's promises for believers in Jesus Christ. But just to refresh our hearts on the kinds of things that God promises to us Christians, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Remember that past tense verb describing a future reality, it's as good as done, that unbreakable chain of salvation. What then, verse 31, shall we say to these things? God for us, who against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who could condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation? Distress? 
persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Just as it is written, for your sakes we are being put to death all day long. We're considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you remember those promises? We can bank on those promises, right? Cling to these promises. We need these promises. These are promises that God has made to everyone who has been born again by the Spirit of God and who belongs to Jesus Christ. Can you break them? No, of course not. You cannot break God's promises. Can you do something to negate them? Of course not. Can you possibly do something to abrogate God's love for you, Christian? No, of course not. His love for you was set upon you before you were born, before you sinned, while he knew everything about you, everything that you would be and everything that you would do. God set his affections on you when you did not deserve it, couldn't know it. God loved you and he loves you still. Can God's promises be broken? To use Paul's own words, may it never be. Let God be found true, and every man a liar. That is exactly what is at stake in the passage before us this morning. I've given the main idea of the passage in the form of a question. It's there for you up on the screen. Can the sins of God's people negate his gracious commitments to them? Can the sins of God's people negate his gracious commitments to them? And the answer to that is in two parts. We'll look at uh, point number one this week, point number one next week. They're identical. No. Point number one is no. This will be the easiest outline to remember. Point number one is no. Point number two is no. And we can ask the question posed in Romans 11 a little bit more specifically. Has Israel's national rejection of Messiah abrogated God's national covenant commitment to her? Has Israel's rejection of Messiah made God change his mind, cancel his promises, renege on his commitments, undo his covenant? Let's read together Romans 11 in the first six verses. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. I alone am left and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. And if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Has God rejected Israel? And again, this is important for us, not because we're concerned about geopolitical history, not because we have a disinterested concern for end times, but in this context, particularly, we must know if God is faithful when we are faithless. And not not faithless in terms of walking away from Christ, but clinging to Christ imperfectly as a Christian, aware of our sin, painfully aware of the things that I do that displease my Savior, and yet I have no other love. Can we undo God's promises to Christians? 
That question is answered by the answer to the question, has God rejected his people in Romans 11? By the way, this is not the first time this question has been asked in Scripture, where contemporary events cause people to say, God's rejected Israel, hasn't he? Listen to Jeremiah 33. This is verses 23 to 26. And the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, have you not observed what these people have spoken, saying? Now listen to what the people said in Jeremiah's day. The two families which Yahweh chose, he's rejected them. Have you heard him saying that, Jeremiah? Thus they despise my people. No longer are they as a nation in their sight. Thus says Yahweh, if my covenant for day and night stand not, and the fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David my servant, not taking from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I will restore their fortunes, and I will have mercy on them. And listen to Jeremiah's words. If, if day and night stop happening, and if the universe stops existing, then I will have rejected Israel. But not before then. And listen to the details of what Jeremiah points out. He, he talks about not only keeping descendants of Jacob and David his servant, but also taking from the descendants of David a ruler to place over Israel. From Jeremiah's day forward, that still has not happened. This is still a promise outstanding that God will fulfill. And God stakes his own integrity with the keeping the universe running on that reality. And God's integrity in this is critical for us. Listen, in a time when the nation of Israel was unfaithful, Israel was in fact enduring the consequences of her obstinance and disobedience. Jeremiah reported that the people believed that God had rejected Israel. And you and I might be tempted to think the same thing. Look, Israel has not obeyed God. God made promises to them. Israel failed in their end of the bargain. And now look at them, scattered, despised, exiled. God's response to such a conclusion is clear. As long as day and night still happen, as long as the universe is still here, God will absolutely not reject his people Israel. And essentially, the same argument is being made here in Romans. And Paul begins this argument in Romans 9, 6. I want you to turn back in Romans a couple of pages and look at Romans 9, 6. This follows right on the heels of what we were just reviewing in Romans 8. Remember, Romans 9 comes after Romans 8. And Romans 9, 6 is this statement. It is not as though the word of God has failed. And if we were living in Paul's day, we should hear Romans for the first time. Reading this letter for the first time, we should read Romans 8. And at the end of Romans 8, say something like, well, those are nice promises, God, but it seems like your word fails because Israel's rejected. By all appearances, they had murdered their Messiah and as a national entity had forsaken the Lord. So is the word of God good? <laughs> And then Paul begins to answer that question, that, that problem raised in Romans 9, 6, with the following three answers. Number one, not all Israel is Israel. That's Romans 9, 6 and following. That is, born-again Jews are a subset of ethnic Jews. In other words, there, are, there is a spiritual Israel, not a symbolic, metaphorical Israel, but a spiritual Israel. That is, a segment of Israel that actually is spiritual indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, relating to God on a spiritual level, saved. And the second answer to the question, has the word of God failed, is found in Romans 9, 24 to 27, and it is the doctrine of the remnant. Not only is the born-again segment of Israel a subset of ethnic Israel, now the word of God hasn't failed because God does save some Jews, but there is also the doctrine of the remnant that God always keeps a remnant, and he has always kept a faithful segment of his people, Israel, faithful to himself. That was true in the Old Testament. It was true in Paul's day. It's true in our day. 
And there's a third answer to the question that Paul gets to in a, in a full culmination at the end of chapter 11. But it shows up in chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, and chapter 10, and it shows up in chapter 11 as well, and that is a future national salvation of Israel. There is a day coming when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in that all Israel will be saved. That day is coming. That is what God has promised. And so those three answers, don't misunderstand. God's word, God's word hasn't failed, Romans 9, 6, or Romans 11, 1. God has not rejected his people because there's a subset of Jews that actually believe. Number two, God is committed to a remnant theology where he keeps a people for himself. And thirdly, there is coming a day when the fullness of God's promises to Israel will be realized in a national repentance and salvation. That's coming. Here in Romans 11, 1 to 6, Paul takes up these same answers. There is a spiritual subset of national Israel. And Paul raises his hand and says, see, I, Paul, I'm an Israelite and a Christian. They're not mutually exclusive. Secondly, Paul's going to develop this idea that God is committed to keeping a spiritual remnant by electing grace. And then all of this will build to the climatic crescendo later in Romans 11, that a day is coming when all Israel will experience God's saving grace on a national level. What Paul begins to develop in Romans 9 is the same thing he's developing in Romans 11. The word of God has not failed and God has not rejected his people. Now, this is critical for us this morning to understand. Remember that this snaps at the heels of Romans 8 and all those great promises to Christians. And if God does not keep unilateral commitments that he made to one group of people, then how could you and I believe his promises to us? That is what is at stake. If Israel's sin abrogated God's covenant with her, then what about my sin? What about your sin, Christian? So let's allow the Apostle Paul to ask and answer this question for us. Can the sins of God's people negate his gracious commitments to them? And the answer is no. No. 11.1, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. May it never be. English translations vary on how to convey this idea. Some say God forbid. Some say by no means. Certainly not. I don't know if any translations say, ain't no way, no how, but that's the idea. Sub points to this no, little letter A. First of all, that would be impossible. It would be impossible for, for the sins of God's people to negate his gracious commitments to them. It would be absolutely impossible. Uh, by the way, this may it never be is the strongest way for Paul to give a negative answer. He, he's pressing the impossibility of this. And the impossibility is bound up in the very words of the question that he says. Has God rejected his people? Uh, this is vocabulary. In fact, exact phrasing from Psalm 94, 14 and from 1 Samuel 12, 22, both of which say, for the Lord will not abandon his people. And the word for abandon there is the same word Paul uses to translate rejected here. I believe he takes the, 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 the phrasing and the vocabulary from these two Old Testament passages. Paul is appealing to Old Testament scriptures to affirm the impossibility of this very thing. God does not reject his people. God has not abandoned his people. The suggestion that God could reject Israel goes against what God has clearly declared. I will not abandon my people. This also contradicts the very nature of God. He revealed himself to Israel as the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God of Israel. And notice verse 1, what he says. God has not rejected his people, has he? Do you feel that possessive pronoun <laughs> Do you feel the weight of what it means to be his? The belonging. Your kids refer to their parents as my parents. There is unique and special relationship. God has established a unique and special relationship with Israel. And he made promises to them over and over and over again in the Old Testament. I will be your God and you will be my people. My people. 
God is pointing out his commitment to belonging to them. He has chosen to identify himself with Israel and to have their name attached to his name and vice versa. By the way, his people, even the phrase the the people of God, is not a generic title, a generic term in your Bible for everyone who is saved. Right? It, it might be theologically true that Jews and Gentiles together in the body of Christ, we, we are the people of God. That, that, that is a theological truth. But that's not the term that the New Testament uses for believers, for Christians in the church era. We are saints, we're Christians, we're a lot of other titles. But the, but the phrase people of God or his people is actually reserved for Israel. Old Testament, New Testament alike. This is a designation in Scripture for national ethnic Israel, and there's no other way to understand people of God or his people in this context other than attached to national ethnic Israel. God has promised again and again to be faithful to his covenant with Israel, holding out his hands, as we saw last week, all day long to a disobedient and obstinate people. You remember when Christ himself was in the streets of Jerusalem and he says, how long, how long will I as a mother hen who seeks to protect and care for her chicks? And God has held out his hands all day long to a disobedient and obstinate people. Listen to some of the words of some Old Testament prophets here. We'll focus on Jeremiah. Jeremiah 30 verse 3. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. Yahweh says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. That's a critical passage. Israel and Judah, you know, since after the time of Solomon, they were separated, a divided kingdom. For God to say they will be reunited and back in their land as Israel and Judah is a significant promise that is still outstanding. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, there's none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. There Jeremiah is speaking about the future great tribulation on the earth, and he calls it the time of Jacob's distress or Jacob's troubling, the troubling of Israel. That is the purification of the nation when God brings trials on them at a national level and also brings them to repentance, salvation. Jeremiah 30, verse 9, they shall serve Yahweh their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. A promise that still has never yet happened. Jeremiah 31, you know this passage, this is a new covenant declaration. And notice to whom it is written, behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. What covenant is Jeremiah referring to? The old covenant that they broke? The Mosaic covenant? Uh, the, 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 the bilateral covenant where promises are made based on obedience and curses are levied based on disobedience? Follow me, be faithful to me and you'll be blessed and you get to live in the land. They broke it. And God is revealing this unilateral covenant, this one-way covenant that is not dependent on someone else's merit or obedience, but solely on the grace of God. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Listen to the end of Jeremiah 31, same context. Thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, Yahweh of armies is his name. If this fixed order departs from me, declares Yahweh, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says Yahweh, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares Yahweh. Listen, these things haven't happened yet. The fixed order of the day and night have not stopped. Nobody has accurately measured the universe. God has not cast off Israel. 
And the acknowledgement in Jeremiah 31, 37 is that they are sinful, obstinate, and rebellious. He acknowledges for all that they have done, declares Yahweh. There's no doubt that Israel as a nation has been rebellious. If we took the time to recount all of the places that God promises to keep his promises to Israel, despite her waywardness, we would be here all day. I want to give you a few examples from key periods in Israel's history so that you understand the flow of what God is claiming here. I want you to think about one from before the apostasy. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30. Of course, this, this comes from Moses. And Moses didn't get to enter the land. This speech, if Deuteronomy was a sermon that Moses preached as sort of his swan song to the nation before Moses died and before they marched into the land of promise, you recognize that this is the constitutional era of Israel's existence. They're not yet in the land. They they don't yet have the the golden era of the kings and the prosperity, David and Solomon. Uh, They're not yet established. Enemies are still in the land. They've been given their constitutional document right, the Mosaic Covenant. They've been given promises by God, but they have not yet even gone into the land. To think about the nation of Israel in its, really in its infancy, and God says some interesting things to them. And in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, you get promises for blessings of obedience, and then you get promises that God would exile and curse the nation for disobedience and idolatry. And then God promises them, you will forsake me. You will be disobedient. And then you get this remarkable promise. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. Actually, go back to verse 5. Yahweh your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. And Yahweh God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you, and you shall again obey Yahweh and observe all his commandments." What a remarkable series of promises from God. Gracious offer. You get to live in the land that I've given you if you'll just be faithful to me. And you won't be, because I know what you're like. And then I'm going to exile you, and you're going to be judged by foreign nations. You're going to be oppressed by your enemies. And then I'm going to do something that you could never do. I'm going to circumcise your hearts to love me. You see, what's required is grace the supernatural power of God in the heart of rebellious and obstinate people to create in them a capacity and a desire and a love to do the things they never could do on their own. Israel's history has been a demonstration of the inability of sinful man to follow God's very reasonable expectations. No one could ever do it. Not with all the privileges that Israel had, They never did it, and only by God's grace will they come around one day and actually love God from the heart. And that is a day when God will bring them back to the land and bless them with all the blessings he promised because they obeyed, but not because they were able to on their own, but because God, by his grace, transforms them from the inside out. That day's coming. And all of that happens before they get into the land, before the apostasy. There's a lesson here in that for us in thinking about God's dealings with Israel. I've heard it said from theologians that Israel had their chance and they blew it. And so now God deals with the church. And the reality is God knew they would blew it and he made promises to them before they blew it. This was God's plan all along. And Israel's sin cannot negate God's plan. I want you to see some of the promises of God that were given to Israel during the exile. Look at Zechariah. So God made these promises to rebellious, disobedient Israel before they were even in the land to begin with, before they even disobeyed and the measures that removed them from the land. And then once they're removed from the land, you get promises like this. Zechariah 8 beginning in verse three. 
Thus says Yahweh, I will return to Zion and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Remember, Zion is that affectionate term, that endearing term that God uses for the city of Jerusalem. It's the term he uses to display his affections for them and his plans to bring them back, set his love on them. Then Jerusalem will be called the city of truth and the mountain of Yahweh of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, old men and old women will again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each man with his staff in his hand because of age, and the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, if it is too difficult in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, will it also be too difficult in my sight, declares Yahweh of hosts. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, behold, I am going to save my people from the land of the east and the land of the west, and I will bring them back and they will live in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Look down at verse 20. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, it will yet be that peoples will come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one will go to another saying, let's go at once to entreat the favor of Yahweh and to seek Yahweh of hosts. I will also go. So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek Yahweh of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, in those days, 10 men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew saying, let's go with you for we have heard that God is with you. That is not the state of things today. And yet that is what God promises. Look at Zechariah 12.10. God promises, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, listen to this, the spirit of grace and supplication. What is the result of God pouring out his spirit on Israel in that day? They will look on me, Yahweh in this context, they will look on me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced. When this is quoted in the New Testament, it's a reference to Jesus Christ, crucified. They will look on me, Yahweh, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This will be the song of Israel, like we talked about in Isaiah 53. They will look back on Messiah crucified in the spirit of grace and supplication, in repentance and mourning, and they will be saved. And of course, Romans 11 is written after Israel's rejection of Messiah. Again, reiterating the same promises of God. In fact, uh, Paul is going to quote Jeremiah 31 in the New Covenant, still in reference to Israel and the house of Judah, in Romans 11, to affirm these same truths, that God has not changed, that God has not gone back on his promises. And you have these promises given to Israel before they entered the land, before they rebelled against God and were exiled. You have these promises given to Israel in the exile, you have these promises given to Israel after the exile, after their murder of Messiah. Listen, if the murder of Messiah is not enough to dislodge a sinner, a sinful nation from God's electing grace, it's a demonstration that God keeps his promises. Listen, Israel's national disobedience is not a surprise to God, and her disobedience did not and cannot abrogate God's promises. We know from Titus 1, 2 that God cannot lie. You've perhaps heard it said that God can do anything. It's not exactly true. There are things God can't do. God can't go against his character, his nature, his purposes, his plans. God cannot lie. For God to make a promise and then to go back on his word is impossible for him. The rejection of Messiah by Israel as a nation will not abrogate God's promises to national Israel. Why? Because it is rooted in grace, not in performance. This is where Paul's going in Romans 10, or Romans 11. Look at verse 6, the end of this section. If it is by grace, it is not on the basis of works. Otherwise, what? Grace is in grace. God doesn't break his promises because they are gracious unilateral commitments. By the way, if it were not grace, 
but it were a matter of works, then what God gave as a reward would be a matter of a wage earned. That God, in fact, would be debtor to sinners. Right? That God would owe us something because I achieved this standard, therefore, God, you owe me a reward for that. That's the religion of man. It never works. You, you can't ever actually do the things that God requires to merit the reward. And God wants to give you as a free gift eternal life if you will just believe. And Paul has already made this point in Romans. I remind you of Romans 4, verse 4. To the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. Right? You get a paycheck from your employer. He doesn't say, wow, you've done me such a favor. No, you just did what you were supposed to do and you're getting paid for it. <laughs> Verse five, but to the one who does not work, but believes him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. That's the heart of the gospel. That's the good news. That if you will abandon attempts at self-righteousness, self-merit, earning your way to heaven, and simply believe that God paid for it totally and fully at the cross of Jesus Christ, for everyone who would cast their lives on Jesus, believe in him solely for eternal life, he takes all your sin and places it on Christ, and he takes all Christ's righteousness and credits it to you. So that God can treat you as if you've never done anything wrong, and as if you'd always done everything right. And this is the only hope of eternal life. It's the only way sinners get forgiven and God maintain his reputation. Justice is satisfied, the sinner is forgiven. Only in Christ. And the promise to keep covenant with Israel is a promise to melt their obstinacy and to overcome their stubborn unbelief. You have to understand that God's promise to Israel is not a unilateral promise that they get to stay in their sin and get to go to heaven. It is a promise that he will actually transform them. It's popular in our day, and perhaps in what we might call reformed circles, to see the church as the replacement of Israel, or the church as the fulfillment of Israel, or the church as the true Israel. Or maybe that that term Israel is symbolic or metaphorical way for God to refer to all people everywhere who love him. Or that the promises given to Israel have been transferred to the church, or that you and I today can claim, although in a spiritual way, the very real, tangible promises that God made to ethnic Israel. That is perhaps the, 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 the conglomeration of the predominant view in Reformed evangelical circles about God's dealings with Israel. That God's promises have somehow been changed or transferred to someone else, or we're Israel. And these ideas are foreign to the Bible. There's not a single verse in your Bible that abrogates God's promises to national ethnic Israel or transfers them to some other party. In fact, God's commitment to keep those promises serves as an unshakable foundation for our faith in the promises of God to us. The reason this shows up in Romans 9 to 11 is because the gospel depends on it. If God isn't faithful to Israel, Romans falls apart. The gospel itself is in jeopardy. Now, what if God could cancel his promises based on our behavior? What quality in me could keep God from taking the promises he made to me in his word and transferring them to someone else down the line? You see, if I've replaced Israel in my theology with myself or with the church, then I've said that I've set up a pattern by which God can take what he promises to me and give them to someone else down the line. God's integrity in this matters. Nothing in me makes the promises of God good, but only the nature of God, he cannot lie, and the character of God, he fulfills what he says. That's what makes God's promises good. By the way, if this is new set of thoughts for you, or, or, or if you want some help in thinking through this, I want to suggest some of the resources at the bottom of the note sheet that's available online, or maybe you printed it off and brought it with you. There's a series of, of books and things there that you can look into this topic. I also want you to know that November 8th and 9th, we are hosting here a video seminar with Dr. Michael Vlock, who has written extensively on this topic. 
uh, premillennialism, the kingdom, the return of Christ, the future of Israel, um, things like that. And, and he's got a, a number of resources. We're actually going to do a video seminar with, here, with him here on campus, a Friday and Saturday, and an extended session on these kinds of things. So if you'd like to learn more, you want to know more, and encourage you to put November 8th and 9th on your calendar. And one thing you can do is take Romans 11. Just open Romans 11 and, and mark through it all of the pronouns. All of the pronouns. You know what a pronoun is? He, she, it, they, them, me, I, you. Those are pronouns. It's a, it's a little word that stands in place of a noun. And this is a great exercise in any time you're studying the Bible, but perhaps especially in Romans 11, to determine the referent of the pronoun. In other words, if I say, Janet and I are going to the store, I mean Janet and Smedley, right? I filled in I with my own name. That's who I mean. And the author has an intent in the pronoun that he uses. Paul means something when he says he, she, it, they, them, we. And it's a great exercise when you're reading your Bible to say, who's the we here? Who's the them? Who's the they? And, and if you will do that in Romans 11, just allow the context to determine for you the referent of the pronoun. In, in other words, look down at verse 11 of Romans 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Who's the them in Romans 11, 11? Israel. And it's very clear because it's said in contrast to Gentiles. So read Romans 11, 11 like this. I say then, Israel did not stumble so as to fall, did Israel. May it never be. But by Israel's transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Do you understand? Fill in the pronouns with the referent. And it will be inescapable to you. What Paul is doing in his argument with God's faithfulness to Israel in Romans 9 to 11, in Romans 11 in particular. First of all, God will not have his promises negated by sinful, rebellious people because it's impossible. But, but secondly, here in verse one, and I know you're looking at your clock and going, only verse one, we're supposed to go through verse six, two through six next week. <laughs> secondly, <laughs> Paul himself is proof Paul himself is proof. Look what Paul says. I myself, this is emphatic, I myself too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. What is Paul saying? I'm a Jew and a Christian. God's not done with his people and I'm living proof. Listen, if Paul saves one Jew in Paul's day, it's a demonstration that he is not totally done with Israel. Because one Israelite is benefiting from the promises that come through Messiah. And Paul holds himself up as the example. He is spiritual Israel. That is, uh, an Israelite with the Holy Spirit indwelling in him. He has spiritual life in him. He is a Jew born anew. He is of the seed of Abraham, he says. That, is, that indicates his genuine ethnic descent. And then he says he's of the tribe of Benjamin. Three times... Paul appeals to this tribe of Benjamin, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, and here in Romans. Why does Paul bring this out? Why, why, why is the tribe important? I think the tribe of Benjamin had a special place in the heart of Israelites. It had a special place in the heart of Paul. It had a special place in the heart of God. In one sense, it's just a way to further emphasize Paul is a legitimate, real Israelite. I can trace my lineage through a specific tribe. But more than that, this specific, specific tribe is an illustration of God's commitment to his people, preservation of people, keeping his promises, and the doctrine of the remnant. You know that Benjamin was one of Jacob's 12 sons. He was the last son. He was the younger brother to Joseph. He was the second son of Rachel, Jacob's beloved wife. I don't know that you're supposed to have beloved wives and unbeloved wives. I think you're supposed to have one. But he favored one, and he was the last son and you know that Rachel died in childbirth. And she named him Ben-Oni, son of my pain, as she was dying. 
heartbreak for Jacob. Jacob named him Benjamin, son of my right hand. And then when Joseph was lost, because his brothers threw him in a hole and then sold him to slave traders and he went to Egypt, Benjamin was lost. Dad thought he was dead. Or Joseph was lost. Dad thought Joseph was dead. Benjamin took dad's place in his heart for affections. By the way, you're not supposed to have favorite children either, but Joseph did. I mean, Jacob did. And then you get the blessings for the tribes, for the sons of Jacob in Genesis 49. And, and listen to what Jacob says about Benjamin. Genesis 49, 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey, and in the evening, he divides the spoil. That's hardly something you would say of your favored son as a blessing. Genesis 49 is prophetic, and God is actually detailing through Jacob the kinds of things that would characterize the various tribes. For instance, line of the tribe of Judah would hold the scepter forever. In other words, the, the line of the king would come through the line of Judah, through David, ultimately Messiah, who would be king, comes through the line of Judah. But here, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf tearing the prey to pieces. And then you get to see that sort of unfold in the life of the, the, the history of the tribe of Benjamin. Some famous Benjamites were Ehud in Judges 3. He was the left-handed swordsman who killed Eglon, the Moabite king, right? So he held his sword on the right leg so he could pull it out with the left hand and kill the guy secretly. Um, by the way, it, ironic swordsmanship for the tribe who is the son of my right hand, left-handed Ehud, right? And then you get the 700 left-handed stone slingers from the same tribe who could, who could hit a hair with a, with a stone in a sling and not miss. And, and then they, they were part of a, a huge battle in, in, in Judges 20 um, in which they took down tens of thousands of the opposing army from some of the other tribes of Israel. In Genesis 19 and 20, we find out that the Benjamites were sinners. I'm not sure I want to encourage you to read Judges 19 and 20. It's pretty awful. And the Benjamites were, were part of what was really awful there. In Judges 20, uh, after the 700 left-handed stone slingers took out so many thousands of the enemy armies, uh, they gathered more troops and then nearly wiped out the tribe of Benjamin. It was nearly exterminated in Genesis 20. Down to 600 men were all that was left. And I think because of that, historically, the tribe of Benjamin was seen as precious in, in, in the sight of the Israelites. In fact, in Genesis, or in, in Judges 20, all the Israelite tribes, they had just been battling against them, now felt bad for the people they routed and said, oh my goodness, we can't lose a tribe. We need to help them out. And so God preserved the tribe. Esther and Mordecai were Benjamites, uniquely used by God to preserve the entire nation of Israel from annihilation. And then Saul of Tarsus was a Benjamite. He shared the same name of Israel's first king, also a Benjamite, Saul. Benjamin in its history was precious in the sight of his father, precious in the sight of God, the recipient of God's promises. They were sinners undeserving of God's promises for blessing. They were miraculously preserved, though nearly extinguished. And then they were used by God for the preservation of the nation. And then you come to Saul of Tarsus, a Benjamite, a ravenous wolf tearing the church to pieces. And then preserved, rescued, and used by God for the salvation of Gentiles and the provoking of Jews to salvation. Paul was living proof that God had affections for his people still. We get to understand next week uh, another example from the days of Elijah we need to make some important caveats that God's covenant commitment to Israel is not a promise that every Jew is going to heaven simply because they're a Jew. We already know from Romans that's not the case. It's not necessarily a promise to protect the present nation state of Israel, the political entity which is Israel on our maps. It's also not an endorsement of her politics or her current moral condition. What's on display in Romans 11 with Israel is an analogy between the national election of Israel an individual election by grace in the gospel for everyone who believes, Jew and Gentile alike. God can't go back on his promises to you, Christian, any more than he could go back on his promises to Israel. And next week, we'll see that in one of the darkest times of Israel's history.
thankful this morning just to reflect on, on Johnny Beckman's life, faithful servant who loved God's word, turned in a prayer card every week. And Johnny now awaits a promise of God still, the promise of bodily resurrection. And while he waits for that promise, he does so in the very presence of his Savior, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And as the Apostle Paul wrote, that is better by far. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your promises, unwavering, unflinching, a reflection of your very character, a reflection of your nature, you cannot lie, a reflection of your purposes to bring sinners humbly to yourself by grace so that they look not to themselves or any merit they could produce, but solely look to your love, your sovereign grace, your electing kindness, whereby you bring people to yourself. God, we thank you that you remain faithful to your people Israel, that you will one day bring them to repentance because it means we can trust you here and now for the very things that you've promised to us. No condemnation, no separation, and all the help in between. We praise you for these things until you take us finally home. Amen.